Hello and welcome to Beyond Reproach. This is Tux Lurzel. Stephanie Domingo. I come to you from Detroit, Michigan, where I record on land belonging to the Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandot nations. And I come to you from Pistoia, Italia, where I'm recording on land belonging to um, Proto Italians. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Italians. Italians. Back over here in the in the U.S. of A. These are some of many nations that are still very much out here doing their thing, and we would like to acknowledge that. And those of you who may have forgotten, Beyond Reproach is the show about scandals and scandalousness in American politics and government. Yes. And as per usual, the ways in which we be drinking and we be swearing, it is a fact. When you think about the ways in which, it's true. That is That is accurate. (laughs) Uh, today we are drinking. Well, I just need to say this first and foremost. Somebody lied oh. to me. <laughs> somebody spun a yarn and told oh, no. me that, <laughs> that we were going to be doing a story about the whole of Europe today. Well, it kind of. <laughs> okay, I'm like, wait, somebody, and wait, I'm the only one here. It, <laughs> yeah. it says I. Um, so my my scandal just got too big, y'all. It's gonna have to be yeah. like a three parter or something, or yeah. like two minis. It's just got really big. I do make reference to Europe, but it is I I force myself to stay in Italy. Okay, no big deal. Mostly, today we are, mostly. Yeah, okay. yeah. At the end, there's not a little, in fonts. Fonts does come up. Oh, okay, okay. Then yeah, I don't feel fonts, so bad. Yeah, <laughs> don't feel bad. It's, uh, it's a delicious cocktail. I'm really yes. excited to drink it. We are we are drinking a French seventy five today. I've actually never had one. Um, I did take a little sip when I was doing the the Instagram video and was shocked at how delicious it is. Of course, it's delicious. Like yeah. I have like I have like overflow cocktail. I made. Uh, oops, amazing. I made too much. <laughs> Oopsie. Yeah. So I chose this because I wanted something that was sort of like European and also um, Stephanie's. <clears throat> Stephanie's story today takes place in the late 1940s or starts in the late 1940s. Yes. Starts in the late 1940s. There's a little um, ambiguity about the actual start date, but either late 40s or early 50s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was definitely popular in the 40s and 50s. Um, according to the Food History Timeline, or actually, I think it's just called foodtimeline.com. Well, the French 75 was definitely invented years earlier, it was really, really popular throughout the 1940s, as evidenced by the number of times it appeared in print in both bartending books and newspaper articles. Like a lot of classic cocktails, the origins of this drink are a little murky. Shocking. Imagine. Uh, But one thing that we do know for sure is that the French 75 was named after a fast-firing 75-millimeter French field gun from World War I. Whoa. That was known for firing faster and more accurately than other guns during the war. Okay. I did not know that until today or until that last war- night when I was researching. That's, I love that it's war related. That ties to my scandal. It's yeah. Gun related. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so outside of the fact that it was named after this this popular and, and highly effective French gun, um, there are a lot of different possible origin stories as well as uh, several different variations on the recipe. So we're going to go through them real quick. I'm going to try and okay. get through this as quickly as I as I can. So the classic recipe that we know today that we are drinking today calls for gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, and champagne. But some older recipes actually call for cognac rather than oh, gin. Yeah. That could be good. Yeah. No, it does sound delicious, honestly. Yeah. Some people believe that this cocktail actually grew out of an Allied fighter pilot unit that was made up of both French and American soldiers during the First World War. And the story goes that they used to drink uh, a mixture of cognac and champagne mixed together after their successful air raids, and that they would toast to the 75 millimeter gun that kept them safe on their missions. Cool. But during the war, the gun also inspired another cocktail called a Soisante Cannes, which is French for the number 75. Um, 
it was created, but it wasn't called the French 75. It was just called the Soissons Cannes. Yeah. Uh, it was created around 1915 by a Parisian bartender. And while this cocktail calls for gin and lemon, like the cocktail we're drinking today, the similarities between this cocktail and the French 75 end there. There's a lot of other stuff in it. There's not champagne in it. It's a very different oh. drink. Okay. Um, so they think that it's possible that they sort of somehow combined the 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 tradition of drinking cognac and champagne together that these allied soldiers were doing and this other Soisant Cans cocktail combine the two to kind of create like evolved into the French 75 we know today. But it's also possible that that's just a totally separate cocktail and like Yeah, just a they, coincidence. It just, yeah, yeah. One of the most popular and commonly cited origin stories is that the French 75 was invented by Harry McEl uh, McElhoney. It's either McElhone or McElhoney. Harry McElhoney mm -hmm. at Harry's New York Bar in Paris. Harry's New York Bar was like super famous. Yeah. Um, I definitely mentioned them before. You've definitely the mentioned them before. Yeah. Sounds super familiar. Yeah. Um, but you whether, I don't remember that last name though. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I don't think I actually even knew his last name until <laughs> what I was researching this story. Um, yeah, I think it's McElhoney, but I did try and like look up the pronunciation and people were also saying McElhone. But so whether he actually invented it or just popularized it, we're not entirely sure. His version did call for cognac rather than gin though. And while gin is much more popular today, a lot of people online were saying, like, you got to try the cognac version. It's really fucking good. It sounds delicious. Yeah, so it was yeah. also called um, a French a 75? French 75. Okay. Yeah. It was, he, I think he was doing this in the 20s. Oh, he, okay, okay. Yeah. So it was definitely after the um, Soissons Cans. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, after World War One was over. In 1927, a the more sort of contemporary gin based recipe that we know today appeared for the first time in print in a cocktail book called Here's How. The story basically goes that the French 75 is essentially just a Tom Collins with champagne instead of soda water, which is pretty actually like I never really thought about it that way, but it's totally champagne accurate. Instead of soda water. Okay. Yeah, it's it's accurate. Just boozier than a Tom Collins, I guess, but a similar flavor flavor profile. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're not really wrong there. Uh, and then when this gin based recipe was published in Harry Craddock's The Savoy Cocktail Book in London in 1930, the French 75 recipe that we are drinking today was spread to bars around the world, which is why the version that we are drinking today is so popular and was so popular in the 40s and 50s. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. So should we Wait take a little taste? Yeah, let's take a little cheersy cheers. I, I like, I'm just smelling the cocktail. I'm already in love. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. So yeah. good. So nice. So tasty. Mm. Yeah. It's like you barely taste the gin, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's just like lemony, yeah. slightly oh. boozier champagne. I love it. It's so good. Yeah. Man. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect cocktail. So tasty. Yeah. It's really I'll, nice. I don't know why I've never had one before. They're I mean, it's delicious. I will definitely order this again. Yeah, I don't really do champagne cocktails. Even like think, a mimosa yeah. is like it kind of gives me a headache, all of that sugar. Yeah. Same. So I But I also a mimosa is not good. Oh, <laughs> come for you the brunch the brunch girlies are gonna drag you i know and i'm gonna be like there he is <laughs> <laughs> get, get him <laughs> um no it's i i do prefer a bloody mary if i was at brunch yes um, absolutely there, there was a I mean, time when the, i the hangover issue is definitely a problem and massive reason, but yeah. also i just don't really think mimosas are yeah. I've seen so many videos online on like Instagram or whatever, like multiple, several many videos of people giving their, um, the like recipes? their, the best recipe for the best mimosa ever. And they pour champagne in the glass and then they take the bottle of orange juice and pull out a trash can and dump it in yeah. the trash. <laughs> I also agree with that. I'm yeah. not a big champagne drinker either. When I was a kid at school learning the golden rule, teacher often used to say, if 
you don't tell a lie, there's not a reason why you can't be like Washington someday. How oh, could Washington be a married man and never, never tell a lie? So I'm jumping in. Um, my story yeah. is it's a it's one that I had to corral a lot because it is kind of big. I heard about it for the first time when I was watching Oliver Stone's documentary, The Untold History uh, of the United uh, States. So I know Tux, mm-hmm. you've you've watched it and did you finish it? It's, I did. It's such a wow. good it's such a good series. I mean, it's, it's been a long time since I've watched it. And yeah. there's so many different topics they cover. So many topics. It's like, it's so dense for that reason. I never finished it because I, I lost so much momentum after Henry Wallace. Like, I think uh-huh. I got to Nixon and I, I just couldn't, like, emotionally bear to go on. Yeah. Um, but I highly recommend, we've, we've mentioned this, this um, documentary before, but if you have not seen it, it's no longer on Netflix, but you can find it online. Like, I, oh. I watched it a little bit to prepare for this scandal um highly highly recommend but just definitely take breaks because it is a lot yeah um so i kind of stopped because i saw the trajectory of the u.s and like how it just got worse and worse after world war ii i feel like the country enjoyed notoriety and um just like there was so much goodwill and credibility Mm -hmm. towards the u.s and then Mm -hmm. to see like intervention by intervention, hypocrisy by hypocrisy, that just uh, fall away was mm-hmm. too much for me. I stopped watching it, Nixon. I'm like, I can't. I can't yeah. get to Bush. Like I I like I already know. I already know what happened <laughs> is how I feel. Yeah. But I do want to finish it um eventually. Have you ever heard of the word gladio before? Does no. that sound familiar from sounds from like gladiator? Gladiator. Does, it actually comes from gladiator. It's the oh. it's the Italian word for a short sword that is mm, known as okay. like a gladius, but that's where we get the term um, gladiator when they used to fight each other. Oh, okay. So my scandal today is known by its code name, Operation Gladio. It mm. was a secret CIA-backed paramilitary network of stay-behinds in Western Europe whose explicit goal was to activate in the event of a Soviet invasion. But in reality, in reality, it was used in the event of the working class gaining too much power. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. But first, America. a toast. A toast. <laughs> a toast. Come on. A toast. A toast. We have champagne <laughs> flutes. This feels extra festive. Um, yeah. To doing fascist things with your friends. <laughs> amazing for those who don't know there was when would when did that clip come out doing oh my Hood god Rats? it's like like a at decade? the dawn of youtube oh yeah. man <laughs> it's been around a long time okay so everyone everyone knows if you don't know about doing hood rat things with your friends you weren't on the internet when it was created yeah um let me <clears throat> i'm adding a little more cocktail um <laughs> Okay, so we are back in Europe at the end of World War II in this lovely, kind of peaceful, quasi-peaceful time before the Cold War really got um, momentum. American and Soviet troops would meet at the River Elbe in Germany and they would shake hands in victory. It was lovely because Mm -hmm. they were these really big powerhouses. They were successful partners in the war and... With the USSR, of course, doing the most to end the war, um, it really Definitely. wasn't until I, I watched um, Stone's documentary that I really saw the scale of the Eastern Front. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the Rush, like they, they won that war for like, – What? Like yeah. the Western Front could never. Like I had no clue because – because as Americans, we are in the Western Front and that's what we learn about. But it's like, Whoa like night and day. Mm -hmm. So it was the great hope that the U S and the Soviets could together with their allies prevent the threat of another global war, Mm. you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, but that didn't happen. The U (laughs) S 
emerged as a powerhouse because of its very, very tiny death toll compared to Europe and Asia. About um, 405,000 soldiers died in the U.S. compared to Russia's 27 million. Holy shit. 400,000, that's it? 405,000, yes, to 27 million. Um, So there's no comparing casualties. And and of course, like, you know, especially if you look at Pearl Harbor versus like the bombs dropped on Japan, like it's Mm -hmm. Europe and Asia were severely damaged during the war. And the U.S. emerged uh, an economic um, leader. Yeah, they became the biggest supplier of pretty much everything, goods and services. It was a really good time for exports. Mm-hmm. Annually, every fifteen, every every year, our exports grew by fifteen percent, like production, like because wow. Europe and Asia was in shambles, and we were the ones who were supplying their, you know, materials for rebuilding. Sure. And, yeah. And, you know, our, our ship wasn't fucked up. We still had all of our factories in place. And like, exactly. other than Pearl Harbor, yeah. nothing had happened here. Exactly. So there was this fear in the US because it was such a boom time. Um, you know, it was it was money, money, money times. There was a fear <laughs> that because Europe and Asia were so badly damaged and that poverty was rising, so many people were displaced that there could be a global depression if things okay. persisted. Sure. Um, and there was a question that if those in power, they were really worried that poor people would kind of embrace revolution in this period of time. They would look around and be like, what can the government do for us? And like, we, mm-hmm. we can't. That would affect American trade and investment. So things started to shift this is just a little bit of table setting. I, ha- I have to set sure. the scene. <laughs> yeah. Things started to shift in the UK after the war. Churchill brought the country through the war, but then wasn't reelected. And mm. he was big mad about that. Yeah. But the British had gone re- grown really, really weary of war. They wanted their government to focus not on empire, but on their people. Imagine. Sure. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, how about you build your own destroyed country instead of trying to hold on to india yeah they wanted an end to imperialism and just yeah focus at home and it was during this time after the war where the uk would give back india pakistan burma sri lanka palestine and jordan wow okay. yeah so they were moving their empire is shrinking the, the yeah. days the days of the british empire were in the past and yet the U.S. was definitely the new kind of swinging dick on the world's stage <laughs> mm-hmm. because Europe needed so much work. The U.S. put together aid packages and, um, you know, the money had to be repaid. But in the meantime, they're just like, oh, well, maybe we can lease out your you can lease out your land to us for military bases. Sure. So so countries that used to be our partners more became like our clients. Because mm-hmm. there is this very deep economic bond now forging after the war. And this is very key for what is going to happen in Italy. But is it's a period of time where things are really relatively calm. There's still a little there's still a lot of fighting, but like compared to the the full um war effort, things are wrapping up. But um the the really hurtful thing about um stone's documentary is that (laughs) they sort of paint these like two parallel visions of the country like what would happen if we went left instead of going right Mm -hmm. and it's heartbreaking getting back to um this period of time after the war in respect to the soviet union they were some of the most vocal anti-fascists i don't know if you're aware of that but like obviously right yeah 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 because they, yeah. they, they fought the hardest against against Germany. But with Truman and this rightward shift that was happening in the U.S., officials started to look at the Soviets like, oh, you are actually a problem. Like, we don't like <laughs> the things that you're saying. Mm-hmm. Even with 27 million 
of their soldiers dead, they still had the largest army in the world after mm, the war. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> I know. That's unbelievable. <laughs> like how? Like how do you still have people? That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, so to top it I all mean, off. Were people forced to be in the army? That Yeah. I mean. Yeah. They were forced yeah. to be in the army. And like women were in the army. Yeah. That, oh, that's okay. how you do yeah. it. That's yeah, how you yeah, do yeah. it. We yeah. got there. <laughs> <laughs> so to top it all off, there's all these people in, in their armed forces and their country is not capitalist. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do communism. Like, no. So long story long. <laughs> <laughs> Winston Churchill, out of power, so incredibly washed, was invited to speak in the U.S. alongside um, Truman. And he took the opportunity. He's like, I have something to get off my spirit. And this is his infamous <laughs> Iron Curtain speech that really, okay. really set it really set the ball in motion when it comes to the Cold War. He really threw okay. gasoline on a fire that was kind of smoldering. And it's like, now, now we're doing something. So he called yeah. out Italy Jeez. in his speech as being part of where the Iron Curtain has descended. He okay. calls out specifically Trieste, which is like in the north of Italy. So Churchill knew that FDR had openly chatted about giving some aid to the Soviets after the war. They were giving okay. aid to everyone else, like, you know, <laughs> Germany, their their fucking rivals were re were given a huge aid package, Britain, France as well. But then Truman got into office. You know, he sort of changed changed the rules a little bit. <laughs> um so it was very clear to the Soviets like who the US had chosen in this post World War II alliance. And that following year, Truman's National Security Act was pushed through. This is 1947. It was pushed through creating a large security apparatus. The OSS. Have you heard of the OSS? Y no. Yeah. You have. Okay. Yes. So the OSS, for people who don't know, they're the Office of Strategic Services. They were the proto CIA, essentially. So Truman's National Security Act, it created uh, a little bureaucracy known as the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it. Never heard of it. The CI and all of the A. Um, <laughs> they, so much, a. so much A. They wish they had A, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Very little A. <laughs> Very concave A, if we're being honest. <laughs> Very little A. Um, That's what so CIA stands for, is concave inverted ass. <laughs> Oh, bitch. Yes. <laughs> so in, um, well, I feel like this is like a drinking game, me mentioning um, Stone's documentary, but he, he calls it capitalism's invisible army, but I, I also like mm -hmm. yours. Yeah, well. boy, yes. They're on the same level in my mind mm -hmm. now. I feel like now I'm always trying to find the name of the episode in the episode in real time. Um, that one's fun, though. So the CIA, it had four functions, three of which were totally regular. It was the collection and the analysis and the dissemination of intelligence materials, like totally fine. This is what the OSS was doing. It's not a big deal. But the third, the fourth one, oh my God, so vague, so dangerous. The fourth function was other functions and duties related oh to intelligence God. that affect the national security as the president sees fit. Oh, okay, sure. So there's all like the, whatever I feel like. Yeah, it's basically like etc. The OSS did have a paramilitary component, and it morphed into the CIA Special Activities Division, which sounds evil. Like just those mm -hmm. words sound very evil. They're very like innocuous on their own, but like they were doing some shit. And these folks, mm -hmm. they got busy in Italy. Um, Italy, if you listen to the last mini, is it's Europe's canary in the coal mine. It's where they test all of their fuck shit. Um, it's the lab <laughs> where they're in, they're in there doing push ups and pull ups and, um, dropping into splits. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> dropping. Yeah. Going back to aid money. So it is worth mentioning that the Soviets did get Marshall Plan. They were offered, I should say. They were offered 
Marshall Plan money, but they declined. Okay. Because that money comes with strings. Sure. And they did not say, want yeah. to be in a capitalist world economy with y'all hoes. Sure. Like, they just, like, no. So, yeah. but because the Soviets said no, American press ran with that, like, oh, they're, you know, they want to do their own thing. We're trying to help because we're so helpful mm -hmm. as we are. Um, so Stalin basically told his allies in all of the countries in the Balkans on his border that don't you dare take that money from the U.S. Like they're going to offer uh -huh. it to you, but say no. Like, yeah, because it's going to come with all of these strings. Yeah. Yeah. So Stalin told his allies, told his his people on the border, like, don't you fucking dare. Like, this is a trick. Obviously, we all know this is a trick. We're going to say no. Mm hmm. But Czechoslovakia said, hey, I'll take your money. Uh -huh. And this is when the USSR invaded. I mentioned this in my last uh -huh. full scandal. And I didn't like that didn't come up in my research. But not to explain it, like you shouldn't you know, breach a sovereign sure. nation. Like that's nothing like you. That is still an aggressive act. But like the articles that I was reading did not miss that little detail. And I'm like, that's kind of. It's kind of important a little. Yeah. I mean, that's like, why does Russia get to tell you you're not allowed to take this money? You know what I mean? Yeah. And just so like they, they were on yeah. some bullshit too. And the country at the time was under communist control, but he was just like, I want the money. Like, sure. let me have the money. And so Show I was me like, the money. <laughs> like, like hell you will. And like grabbed mm -hmm. their whole nation. So, so NATO was formed in response to what happened in Czechoslovakia in 1949. I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And it's important yeah. to the context of Italy. Again, this is my, this is my table setting because Italy shares a border with the former Czechoslovakia. Okay. Yeah. In the North, the Northeast. So there was an amendment to the NATO protocol that was mandatory for admission into the pact. If you didn't sign this, you didn't get to PASCO. Like mm -hmm. there was a clause that was extremely controversial. And it essentially said that countries who sign with NATO are not allowed to prosecute right-wing terrorists or any anti-communist activities in their own country. What? The quiet part they wrote it down yes you're gonna look the other way friends if you want this money i mean i guess there's no money when it comes to nato but like it is a pact it is an alliance where sure we're all gonna say like oh i don't know i don't know what happened yo that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> fuck holy shit yeah okay so jumping in <sighs> jumping <Yeah>. in <laughs> so we we know from my last scandal that Italy had a dictatorship, uh, had Mussolini, had Il Duce for 20 years. I didn't mention that the last two years of World War II, it was basically a civil war between the fascists and Nazi occupiers on one side and just mm -hmm. everyone else, like the centrist, the left, um, what they, what Italy called the resistance on the other side. So in Italy, the political left had been suppressed. I mentioned this in my last episode suppressed under Mussolini, but they were mm. growing in reaction to the right losing power. They're just like, okay, this is like, we can see the writing on the wall. Like they're coming for y'all. Like, yeah, it's our time. <laughs> so socialist groups were gaining momentum and joining with the communist parties as natural allies against fascism. And they were merging into what became known all over Europe as socialist unity parties. And okay. the CIA was not a big fan. Yeah. Not a big fan. Hmm. Imagine that. So it is hard to know um, exactly when Operation Gladio started. It's hard to know when covert ops start. But eventually they do start writing shit down, which is wild to me. It's like, <laughs> don't put shit in writing. Don't do this. Um, 
So the earliest whistleblowers flag this program formally starting in 1951. However, there are some reports that Gladio started shortly after the, the CIA fuckery in regarding the election in 1948, which okay. seems kind of likely. Yeah. Um, and there's also reports that it started two years before with the OSS running paramilitary functions throughout northern um, Italy. But it was definitely in operation by 1951, but probably before. So just okay. to clarify a little bit about the OSS, because <laughs> they really loved Italy. I mean, there's <laughs> a lot to love. So the OSS was headed by a man named William Donovan during World War II. He played a key role in directing operations in Northern Italy and Western Europe, just in general. And he would become a founding member of the CIA. During the war, he was responsible for coordinating intelligence and just, you know, being a spook, essentially sabotage, um, you know, covert ops, doing all of all the things you're not supposed to do. But he was doing it in the name of weakening the access powers in Italy. So it's like, OK, you're doing bad things for a good cause, I guess. So, yeah, we're going to like, yeah, I'm going to let you rock, <laughs> I guess. Um, his number two, however, a man named James Jesus Angleton. Okay. He was half Mexican, um, mm -hmm. but all bad. He probably, <laughs> he probably hated tacos. Mm -hmm. Um, so he worked under Donovan and was kind of like the golden boy. He had spent time in Italy as a child. His parents had, his dad was like some financier or something. He lived in London and then the family moved to Rome. And okay. because he could speak Italian and he, you know, he had that connection. They're like, oh, okay, like you're going to run the division here in Italy. Mm -hmm. This guy's father was very impressed by Benito Mussolini, if okay. that can tell you anything about the type of person that he was. Mm hmm. So this man, by all accounts, even the people who like kind of praise him also say that like he was actually crazy. Like he was yeah. really, really paranoid, like really paranoid. He could see communism in everything. He is credited for coming up with a concept of a mole within a security company, like someone who is potentially a, a double agent. And he... Uh -huh. He was the one who encouraged the CIA and all other government um, surveillance organizations to loyalty tests, to spy oh, on Jesus. their employees. Yes. Uh -huh. He called okay. them mole hunts. And oh, yeah, like just the worst, most toxic man. And also he, whatever, I shouldn't say this. He's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> i feel i felt like oh my i am becoming my mother <laughs> this man looks like a toad he looks like a toad i'll put him on <laughs> he looks he looks like his true form actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looks like how he, how he should look he has a look he deserves <laughs> <laughs> I love that for him. so um <clears throat> yeah <laughs> So he was very happy to be running the the day to day of the of Italy's Operation Gladio. So I think this is a good time for a break. When we come back, we can get into all of the receipts of this Ooh. really fucked up network. Yeah, mess. I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah, you're not ready. Whew. Okay, BRB. Welcome to Hashtag History. I'm Rachel. And I'm Leah. And if you're a history nerd or even a history hater, this is the podcast for you. Even if history was your least favorite subject in school, we can guarantee you will like this podcast because we talk about all the things that your history textbooks did not. Things like how the Bonnie Prince Charles and his Jacobite uprising was 
was a bit of a disaster. Yeah, or how the pharaoh Akhenaten was so disliked by Egyptians that they literally purged his name from nearly all of their records and pretended like he had never existed. And we do all of this while drinking and rating a custom-made cocktail specific to that week's topic. So grab a drink, take a seat, and hang out with us each week as we learn all about history's greatest stories of controversy, conspiracy, and corruption. All right, and we are back. Mm-hmm. We're back, baby. I have I more cocktail. Um, <laughs> just a, just a, a spot of more cocktail. Mm. It's so good. It is really, really nice. If this it's, is what mimosas tasted like, I would oh, always be ordering mimosas. Yeah, me too. Or what I should say is that they should just offer French 75s at brunch instead of mimosas. Yeah. Yeah, orange juice is not good. Orange juice is like for, I don't know, for babies or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when when do you drink orange juice? I actually, wow, I am a liar. I drink orange juice all the time, but it's freshly, it's squozen. It's, it's freshly it's, squozen, yeah. It's called a spremuta, and it's like you just, it's very popular. It's a, it's one euro. Mm. And whenever I mean, I'm feeling like I need a little, if it's like sugar, fresh local oranges and it's yeah. fresh, fresh squozen, it is. Why not? Okay, so back to this scandal. So the biggest chunk of receipts found start around June of 1953. Wonderful. Yeah, odds are it was going on before that, but this is when they I mean started... the, the receipts had come from somewhere. It's not like they just like appeared yeah. in 1953. Yeah. So the Italian military service, it's known in Italy as CIFAR, like S-I-F-A-R. They wrote all this shit down. They wrote a field manual. Like, don't put this on paper. Don't do it. I mean, if the School of Americans can do it, the School of the Americas, I mean. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But it's like you're running a secret army with the CIA. Like, don't do it. But. Yeah. But I'm glad that they did because this is fucked up and, it, and we should totally. know about it. Yeah. So it it documented that this secret army had linked up with right wing terrorist groups. Color me shocked. So Tux has just fainted. So we need to <laughs> give, give, give us a moment. I know you just heard laughter, but he's he's fainted. He I'm laughing in my sleep. In the- <laughs> <laughs> So it names that they were working with, or at least trying to work with, um, Ordine um, Nuovo, which was a a very, it was a fascist group that was responsible for terrorist events already. They were working with them. Mm They were also working with the Avangardia Nazionale to engage in domestic terror. They were basically saying Mm -hmm. like, hey, I like the cut of your jib. I see what you're doing. It's like you, me, same. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Oh, oh my God. It's so funny. Um, so, so there, there are these field manuals that were uncovered MBD <laughs> with, with all of the receipts. This was all set up under the defense minister at the time, a man named Paolo Tavini. He was a part of the Christian democracy, the party that the U.S. was pushing. Color you shocked, right? Yeah. uh uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, this sounds great. Yeah, I'll I'll sign here. Mm -hmm. Sir. Sir. Wild. Yeah. So per their manuals, Gladio armies, they served a dual purpose. Because they wrote out their mission, which was, it wasn't all bad. So they were, hear me (laughs) out, it wasn't all bad. Okay. So the the first point in their guide was that they were to prepare for a communist Soviet invasion in an occupation of Western Europe. Sure. Yeah. Which was, kind of made sense. The Soviets had just grabbed Czechoslovakia. Sure. Anything was possible. Like they could come over mm-hmm. with an army. You don't know. Yeah. However, they said in the absence of an invasion, they were to pre- they were to prepare for an emergency situation. 
if there isn't oh my god okay i'm just gonna let you go on you can't make sense out of nonsense there thank you for just i like <laughs> that you you tried and you're like nope disengage so their first their first purpose was very clear and i i agree with trying to prevent a soviet invasion like i don't think there's sure. anything wrong with that um they wanted to have these I Go just on. feel like it's a little like that's the whole cold. It, it's just the like constant one upsmanship of the Cold War makes me very yeah. Um, yeah. resistant to the idea of like, well, maybe nothing will happen, but like, we, why yeah. should that stop us from just spending yeah. three quarters of our budget on yeah. the military? The es escalation factor is, yeah, you're right. You're right. Cause it is, it is a one like, oh, they did this. Now we're going to do this sort mm -hmm. of situation when really nobody's doing anything but just like i saw that you're you're yes. preparing more than i'm preparing yeah so now i need oh to prepare god. more and then oh you my see god. me preparing yeah yeah it's like fomo but when it comes to preparing for war yeah um so we're getting prepared to prepare and this is the first time <laughs> we're getting prepared to prepare so it's okay because it was the first time we we're getting prepared to prepare <laughs> so um where was I? <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. No, Thomas is going to cut out the where was I, but uh, let's see. Uh, or maybe he's not. I don't know. Um, I love Enter to Thomas to say, yeah. like, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm going to let you struggle. Oh, you bit your sweet baby. This is staying in. So they wanted to have, <laughs> they wanted to have this, this army basically lying in wait, sure. ready to spring into action behind enemy lines. If, the Soviets breach, breach the border. Mm -hmm. They wanted them to set up local resistance movements. Basically, they wanted them to hold the territory as much as they could. In their manual, they said that like one of their functions could be evacuating pilots who had been shot down in you know in this theoretical war zone. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. <laughs> they wanted them to sub sabotage supply lines and production centers and just basically hold their positions if they could sure yeah totally they wanted to have arm caches that were hidden in escape routes that were prepared and they wanted them to kind of flex their network the network of fascists mm -hmm. who they could rely on to create chaos in the ways that fascists normally love to do and they weren't they weren't specifically singling out fascists but they wanted to find people who were very motivated to fight against communism and those people are usually very very fascist so they would be given training in explosives like if they didn't have training already <laughs> because sometimes mm -hmm. they are pulling people who are actual active terrorists but sometimes mm -hmm. they weren't. It's like <laughs> big brothers, big sisters. Oh my gosh. Fascists. Yes. Yeah. So they would they would give these people, if they didn't have training already, training. This was all done in secret from the public. The government of mm -hmm. Italy, they were well aware. People in the defense department in Italy, they were well aware. But people didn't know. And sure. they were very, very um they wanted agents to be in the north the northeast if possible so if there weren't agents there already they wanted to like basically airdrop them in they would sure. airdrop these agents in in the dead of night it was usually just one or maybe two people and they mm -hmm. would basically find uh they would create a safe house for them because italians are very very nosy and you <laughs> can't just be a new person in a small town like everyone yeah. is gonna be like who the fuck are who, you who are you what are you doing here why are you here yeah what, why are you here what's like, your dad's you... name like thank <laughs> you yeah like are who's your cousins like give me your uh -huh. whole family history and i yeah so just a little aside italians are are very nosy and for the longest time when i traveled here it, it felt really uncomfortable because mm -hmm. people stare into the depth of, of my soul yeah but 
I, I, I've learned from natives who just go to a different part of Italy and they stare into the depths of their soul. If it's a small yeah. enough town, they're just like, yeah. who are you? What are you doing here? And I just, I thought it was because you're not I'm, from around these parts. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> What's you reading for like yeah. that energy. <laughs> so if there aren't, if there weren't agents in areas where the CIA wanted there to be agents, they would drop them in the dead of night and put them in safe houses because they didn't want to set off any alarm bells. So the CIA started to funnel money from the Marshall Plan because these agents that's aren't what cheap. That's for. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This is this is what we call foreign aid, don't you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, um, I do know actually. Yeah. Yeah, the School of America has taught me about foreign aid. Um mm-hmm in a really sad way and this is just i mean this was before then so yeah Yeah. again this is the model for what we (laughs) what we would do everywhere um so it was because the threat of communism was so great they did in at least in the beginning feel an immediate threat of the soviet union coming across the border i really do believe that Especially with Czechoslovakia. I mean, that makes sense. They already snatched. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I get that. I mean, Czechoslovakia was was their ally, though, before. And they were already communist and had agreed to not take that money. And then they did. Yeah. So it's not exactly the same situation. But I I still, in theory, I still get it. And the U.S. was escalating. Like, every time they had a disagreement with someone, they're like, oh, well, we can throw this bomb on you. Like mm-hmm. things were heightened. They yeah. were doing nuclear tests. And then yeah. the Soviets oh are doing ne- nuclear tests. And like, it was just anything could happen. And I understand that they wanted to be prepared in Italy because they share a border. God, the 50s were wild. Like, truly wild. The, like, so, this is the time that everybody's like so nostalgic for. Like, I let's know. go back and create, like, nuclear fallout like just all over the fucking globe and these people clearly have no sense of history when i hear anyone wanting to go back to the 50s and like the amount of fear the fact that they think the 50s was peaceful is just the only thing that people think of if like what they're the reason they want to go back to the 50s is because we had a very high marginal tax rate so there was a middle class a white middle class but there was but they don't know that well, they know that there was a middle class and the middle class was thriving and everyone was happy. Yeah, like, I mean, but they don't theory. know that it's because of taxes. Like, no, they don't know that. Who, no, no. Yeah, no. who care about that? Like, no, they yeah, think no. it's, they think there was no taxes. People just had money for yeah. no reason. Yeah. Like we said, all of this makes sense if you were playing real defense against um, a potential invasion. You know, you don't have to, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready type of thing. <laughs> I get mm-hmm. it. However, yeah, oh my God, yes. <laughs> Especially the first time you start to prepare. No, yes. Um, if you stay prepared, you don't have to prepare. That's that's that's, that's the name of the episode. That doesn't roll off the tongue as much. If you but stay I, prepared, you don't have to get prepared. But it's it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, this all makes sense. However, this second purpose, this emergency situation business. The preparation for an emergency situation is the second tenet of what kind of emergency situation? Poor people doing things? Perhaps, yes. So yeah, yeah, very, very sticky. It's super, super vague, but I feel like in this vagueness is where the CIA like shines. Like they love Uh this shit. They love this shit. So there's there's so many articles, so many think pieces about like what they meant when they said emergency situation. Um, But it, it probably meant just people doing things like Mm -hmm. civilians pushing for change in their government, Mm -hmm. pushing for rights, pushing for anything that's, I guess, destabilizing to the American pocketbooks, super, super vague. So there was a secret agreement with, Italy's military secret service, Sifar, in the CIA, that communist parties, to some degree, (laughs) and socialist parties also, had a real potential to weaken the NATO alliance from within. Hmm. Therefore, they constituted a threat or an emergency situation. 
Yeah. I like the level sure. at which you're, you're squinting. It's yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm just going to sit here and make faces. Cause yeah, I wish you could hear Tux's faces. <laughs> they're, 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 they're screeching. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they felt that if, yeah, if, if leftists or even people who are slightly left of center gained power and momentum, it would fuck the game up, you know, especially when it ca came to defense. Mm -hmm. If leftists controlled the defense ministries, perhaps they'd say like, oh, we don't need to fight. We should just focus on building up our country after a war. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard to know what what they really thought, but like this emergency sure. situation, super fucking vague. But yeah, 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 basically, yeah. it was people. The people within the country constituted the emergency situation. And yeah, you could point at anyone basically and say like, oh, now it's an emergency because look at mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Anyone that I don't like doing something I don't like is. Exactly. Yeah. I've got an army. Why shouldn't I use it? Yeah. And that's that's how they felt. At first, they were just training one or two people at a time. But then, because money was being diverted from the Marshall Plan in, in greater chunks, they started having training camps in Sardinia. Sardinia is this island in Italy. It's like below Corsica and above Sicily. It's gorgeous. I went there okay. once, and um, it's just it's so pretty. Very few people go there. There's more sheeps than, uh, sheep than people. Hmm. Um, so when I run into an Italian and I tell them like everywhere I've been, they're just like, Oh, I've never been. How is it? And I always say like, it's like Jurassic park. And they <laughs> always sheep. respond. I've never seen that movie. And oh. then I laugh and I tell them you're not missing anything. Like I know enough yeah. Italian to tell them that like, it's a bad movie. Like, don't mind me. You. Jeff Goldblum is clothed. <laughs> in that movie no, he has his shirt off at some point so yeah at first they were just training a few people and then they're sending people to sardinia and the people that they are picking are getting worse and worse i have like 10 other scandals i could do about mm -hmm. this um related to uh gladio but so it, there was an idea that these men these solitary maybe two men at a time they would be these bases for operation and then Things they would augment as needed once the border had, had been breached. But because no one came across the border, there was no threat coming from without. They focused very quickly on subverting the will of the people living in Italy. Yeah. And then they started subverting the will of people just living in Europe. Mm -hmm. The program spread within a few short years. The CIA backed Gladio network included cells in Belgium, France, Greece, West Germany, in the Netherlands. According mm -hmm. to the German newspaper Die Welt, Die Welt, um, the operation was expanded to all of Western Europe by 1959, including neutral Sweden and Switzerland. There were Gladio programs there they're right wing um i just like the whole fucking the whole point of it was that the soviets had just invaded czechoslovakia and like hey maybe they'll do more and then it didn't happen so why are they continuing to expand this network because nothing cold war ever happened because cold war it's maddening okay. Ugh, because cold war because of fear like it, it had created such an environment of fear where it just, yeah, these are, but they really felt it, I think. I don't know. I mean, I, sure, but like you're, you're breeding the fear and then being afraid. Yeah. So how do we know all of this? <laughs> Who spilled the beans? Because there are so many people, um, so many <laughs> all over Europe who were involved in these networks. So it all came to head in the 1990s. On November 14th, 1990, there was a headline in the Washington Post that read CIA organized secret army in Western Europe. Hmm. And the news had broke that morning in Rome. The Italian oh, prime wow. minister was just briefed. He's just like, wait, what? The minister, his name was Giulio Andreotti. 
So he found out about it that day, gave a speech to his whole Senate, which is like, hey, guys, like he threw everything off the table. He's like, I need to talk to you right now. This shit is crazy. So he detailed how for 40 years, 40 years, these secret terrorist organizations trained by the CIA had manipulated the political control of not just Italy, but Europe. Mm hmm under the guise of anti-communism they sponsored and trained people who would terrorize europe for 40 years four zero is old as we are soon to be for 40 years <laughs> so this news shocked all of europe like once italy flagged this that same day like italian ministers they got on the phone they called everyone in europe and they're they're like hey they call their contacts like hey like what is going on talk to your prime minister talk to your your def defense person get back to us because we think that this gladio thing is not just in italy sure we have yeah. records that say like this shit is in the netherlands this is all over so talk to your people and get back to me that same day pretty much all of europe said like hey also yeah we we <laughs> knew about this Fuck. Yeah, because they were all part of NATO and they signed sure. that dotted line that said yeah, like, yeah, yeah. hey, when up to the present, what, what what was it exactly? Let me look. Um, so the NATO clause that everyone signed was that you are not allowed to prosecute right wing terrorists or any anti-communist activities in your country mm -hmm. if you want to be part of this NATO if you want to be down with us, gang signs. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to be in the no homers club. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God. That Homer, he's like, uck, yuck. <laughs> <laughs> no homers. Yes. Plural. <laughs> bitch, check yeah. the S. <laughs> yeah. So that same day, a, a Belgian <laughs> former army intelligence official told the AP that at least six arm caches were spread all over the countryside in his nation until two months ago. So there's, yeah, two months ago. And it's like, but why didn't you say anything two months ago, friend? Why this is really, okay. Because everybody Weird. knew that it was happening and everyone was cool with it up until two months ago. But two months ago, why two months ago? Well, I mean, whenever the, whenever they, like the new Italian No, but this PM, is, this is the same day. They're saying like, okay. oh, we stopped it two months ago. And it's like, oh, but why didn't you alert mm. me two months ago? Uh -huh. Huh. So in addition, the Dutch said that, oh, yeah, we had some large weapons caches that we found um, a decade ago. Okay. But why didn't you didn't tell think to tell anyone? Why didn't you tell anyone? It's like only Italy got really upset about this because, I mean, it, it had been going on for so long in Italy. But so... Andriati, the, the prime minister, he told the parliament that at the height of the Cold War in the late 1950s through the 1960s, the Italians had hid so many weapons. They buried weapons. They had mm. all of these depots all over the country. But at the time of this relevation, um, this, the news coming out, there were still six, uh, there were still 600 people who were on the payroll for Cladio in 1990. Yes. 1990. We are past the Cold War. Still on the payroll. But still but poor people might try and like do something. Might stand up for themselves, so you can't have that. But so did they ever find all these weapons? Do they know where they were or So were they, they found most like of them. They found they okay. found all but 12. <laughs> and they're just like buried in some italian grandma's backyard like she's gonna be planting well, went, begonias one day and <laughs> they went to the place where they were supposed to be and they weren't there i see so they're in in someone's home like yeah one of these 600 them. people that were still on the payroll probably has however i'm gonna i'm gonna maybe they were already used because it wasn't just like guns it was like bombs like okay bombs went missing like mm -hmm. a bunch of bombs went missing Jesus. So this Italian PM, he is so shocked. 
eventually the program obviously is dismantled because it is the end of 1990. Like, why are we still doing this? Why are we still playing Literally. Cold War games like this? Why, mm -hmm. why, why do we have a countryside full of like buried bombs? Like, what is what is happening? So there were calls throughout Europe for the U.S. to apologize for what it had done, or at the very least, explain themselves. In Washington, they <laughs> they basically pointed at Italy. They said. The continued existence of the force in Italy was solely an Italian operation. We have no control over it whatsoever. Okay, have no control is present tense, which I do believe, perhaps, maybe. But also, you started this shit, sirs and madams. <laughs> Literally. Solely an Italian operation? No, it wasn't. You lie. You lie. And we have papers that say that you lie. So officials wouldn't comment because people are just like, okay, but we have we have all of these receipts though. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, but it sounds it sounds like Gladia was part of a, a larger network within Europe. The answer was no comment. Like they the mm -hmm. US had nothing to say after that, after it came to light. <laughs> la 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 la. la. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Andriati, he <laughs> he only learned about Gladio. Because there was a Venetian lawyer, um, someone named Felice Casson, they stumbled upon the existence of this investigation into a, a terrorist attempt. Not attempt, a terrorist bombing. There was a bombing that involved a neo-fascist that happened 18 years prior to this, where mm -hmm. the bombs were Gladio bombs. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the investigation revealed that the explosives that were used in this 1972 car bombing came directly from one of the caches buried in the countryside that Gladio kept as, you know, just in case the Soviets come and get us. Mm -hmm. So this bomb killed three police officers in this small northern town in Italy. And it was placed by this neo-fascist. He was probably employed. He denies that he has any connection with the CIA, but mm -hmm. he is a neo-fascist and he had access yeah. to their yeah. weapons. It seems a little like of a coincidence that he's not going to say that he was like, he's not going to, his whole mission is to deny the yeah. existence of this. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. That's so sweet. he, he is, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, but like he did mm. what he did and he used, he used um, the bombs that we gave him. So according to the prime minister, there were 139 arsenals that they found just buried in the uh, countryside, these caches of weapons that included um, guns and <laughs> bombs. Bombs yeah. buried. <laughs> Twelve of them, like I said, were never recovered. So in the years and decades that followed, there have been a number of possible links between Operation Gladio and extreme right-wing terrorists that are now seen to have been connected. Again, there's there's not there's not a lot of information. Like and people are are you know they're they're holding their tongues, mm -hmm. but there was a period in the 1970s through the early 80s that in Italy they call them the years of lead. Because there were so many terrorist bombings that were on both the right and the left. Because there was so... Because the U.S. was... I mean, it wasn't just the U.S. The British were also here. Sure. And I left them out of my my scandal because I'm like, not my duck, not my bottle sort of situation. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of players involved. There's a lot of fuckery. But the fact remains that our bombs have been in multiple terrorist attacks sure maybe they just Good found probably. them and got lucky who knows that is that's possible yeah it is possible though. it seems unlikely though considering Perhaps. yeah they yeah these these weapons fell into the exact hands of the people that we wanted them to be in the hands how of you. how dare you <laughs> according to washington like when every this surfaces like every 10 years basically on the anniversary and the U.S. just denies everything. There's sure. the last statement they had was, if there are any 
allegations that the CIA was involved in terrorist activities in Italy. They're absolute nonsense was the last that they said in like 2008. Sure, Jan. Yeah, but it's like, but we have the receipts. Like the CIA was running Gladio as far as we know from 1951 through 1959, where they with NATO continued to run it for 40 years. So we, we, we know that. The CIA, with foreign governments, secretly or independently, they sought people who were right-leaning and very violent. Maybe yeah. they weren't terrorists, but they were okay with terrorism. <laughs> yeah. And they hated communists. And mm-hmm. that was that was the means to, to their end. And I'm just gonna leave it here because this is this is a really big scandal, and I <sighs> It's, yeah, it's a lot. And Gladio was big in Italy, but it was even bigger in Ukraine. So I'm just going to end it. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's, I, I, I can't say that I'm surprised. I wish I was. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was really eye opening to see what, these alliances are really about sure yeah yeah yeah, for sure like, and like what could have been in these countries if we what? weren't there to like disrupt yeah you know and it's like they needed help like it's they were at a such a vulnerable period in their history mm-hmm. and they're just like yeah whatever yeah like yeah communists are bad like yeah i'll sign here but it's like i don't think they really knew what yeah we were that could be yeah and maybe we didn't know what that would mean but (sighs) yeah it's possible that this was not the original (laughs) intention but yes exactly fuck that man forever forever um well my my drink is done been empty yeah uh because it was so damn tasty really really nice uh america's history is juicy we just add gin and champagne and lemon juice Yes. No big deal. Thank you so much for listening to Beyond Reproach. This has been Tux Lurzel. And Stephanie Domingo. And thank you to our audio editor. We could not do this without him. Our audio editor, Thomas. Yes, yes. It would be impossible without this man. Yes. Thank you lovely. to this man. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Beyond Reproach. Please note we are not historians. We are just a couple of drunks who never shut up and love history. A full list of all source information can be found in the show notes on our website. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. Written reviews are especially important. If you like us, please do one of two things. Leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts or send this episode to a friend, family member, or someone who you think would be into it. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And make sure you follow us on Instagram because we post our cocktail recipes the Thursday before each full episode. Please drink along with us if you are not driving. We also have a shop on beyondreproachpod.com. Get your merch, brand yourselves. We also have exclusive content on Patreon where you can directly support the production of our show.